All right. Well, I better do a good job with this one. This guy is a uh, giant, uh, literally, figuratively. 16 years in the NFL, won the Super Bowl last year with the Rams, started 52 games in his LSU career. Listen up, kids. Never missed a game or a practice due to injury. Iron Man, Andrew Whitworth. Andrew, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, brother. Appreciate you having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Uh, it's great to visit with you. We've been watching you. We we watched you up close, and then we watched you from afar. Um, just real quick, how do you how does it feel to be energized on Sunday uh, or retired? Excuse me, on Sunday morning, do you pop out of bed and still want to play? Or are you you sleeping in? I mean, how you feeling these days? You know, I think the first couple of weeks I had to get used to the fact I could stand up and uh, be okay. I my, my walk <laughs> in the morning to get dressed <clears throat> was a. Uh, much better in retirement. I'll say it that way. I'm not holding on to the walls, trying to get myself to the closet. Uh, you know what? It feels good, man. The body feels good. It's been in, it's fun to watch now and not have to get hit. And uh, I've enjoyed it. Good deal. Well, down here in Baton Rouge, obviously a sold out crowd is awaiting LSU and Alabama to play in Tiger Stadium on Saturday night. LSU Bama week is always intense. Um, how, what are your feelings about the game this time around? I'm excited. I mean, it's a great opportunity for, you know, this Brian Kelly regime to to show uh, what they're all about. I mean, I think you think these opportunities, you just want to see the team continue to grow, continue to move in the right direction. And I know how much this game means to the, you know, the players and everyone involved. And and I think uh, it's going to be a heck of a game. I can't wait to see it. Um, Andrew, over the years, as Alabama's won more of these games than LSU has, they've talked a lot about trench play, and Bama is getting the guys in the trenches that are making the difference. Uh, have you seen that over the years, and do you think hopefully Brian Kelly with his offensive line and background can can change that? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously you look at the LSU group, especially on the offensive side, you know, you're really young. So, I mean, this is this is a really young group, but they've played well. And and so I think that it's one of those things when you look at Nick Saban and what he's done at Alabama, it's no different than when I came in with him at LSU. Uh, you know what? He has an eye for that. And the guys who play really well up front on both sides of the football, you look at our offensive line and defensive line from his time uh, here at LSU, it was probably one of the best groups in the country. And I think that's something he's continued to do while he's at Alabama. And you see Kirby Smart – try to do the same thing in Georgia. And so we know how important that is, especially in college football. You good on, on either side up front, uh, you're going to have a good football team. And so it's great, it's great for LSU right now, with the youth they have, you know, what to show where they are and, and show where they're headed. And I think this is a great opportunity for those guys up front to, to set the tone. Uh, Andrew, Will Campbell, uh, 318 is 3-1 great, right? Uh, you're, yeah. you're neck of the, <laughs> your neck of the woods there. Can you imagine, I mean, even as great of a player as you were, you redshirted your first year, right? Yeah, I did. You know, I always say I had the worst uh, freshman year ever. I redshirted, almost played in every single game, got to dress out. You know, they gave you the whole thing. You're going to play. And then every single week, it's like, you know what? We're going to hold off, actually. It's not worth it. Uh, so I, you know, all my buddies are texting me from tiger land, just having a blast. And I'm in tape, just standing on the sideline watching, you know, uh, Rodney Reed and Jason Baggett and those guys play. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? I think it worked out. Okay. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy my red shirt, but for wheel, man, it's really special to watch. I mean, he's somebody that had a lot of confidence coming out of school. You knew he thought a lot about his ability and, and to see him come up and show it. Um, it's one thing, you know, confidence is one thing, but going out and showing it every week, every week and the way he has, uh, you know what, I think it's something when you, when you listen in camp, you heard positive things and for him to go out and prove it has been cool to watch. Yeah. And he's so grounded and so humble, you know, it, it, even if you compliment him, he's just like, well, sir, I'm just doing my best and I'm just trying, you know, uh, just a good old country boy who's uh, starting as a true freshman, pretty amazing. It is that and at that spot. I mean, you think about it too. You watch their games. I told somebody the other day, it's it's not, you know, it's not like they're starting in an offense where they're not asked to pass protect and drop back and do a lot of those things. I mean, you know, they're sitting in the gun throwing the football. I can remember playing as a young player, you know, in the in the SEC at that time. There's a lot more under center offense. And and even when you were in the gun, you still ran it a lot more than you threw it. And so I think that it's one of those things, what they're doing and the ability to be able to come in and do that as true freshmen in that conference uh is is rare it is really really rare and so i hope those guys stay healthy and have the opportunity to have great careers and real quick uh emory jones too from catholic high is another true freshman out there having to hold down another tackle spot 
Yeah, Emory's another one. I mean, you know, for with both of those two guys. I mean, you look at that two bookend tackles, that young playing in the SEC. Uh, like I said, it's just it's it's hard to imagine that. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine in that offense at that age being asked to go out there and play the way those guys have has been a lot of fun to watch, and it's something people ought to have a lot of pride in and realize that you know what that gives you a bright future when you when your two edges are like that. Those guys stay healthy, and what you can do to supplant really over the next couple of years inside. Um, really gives you an opportunity to have a great special group up front, which should lead to more wins. And, and Brad Davis, the offensive line coach, kind of a guy that we're really rooting for. He was kind of a nomad throughout his early coaching career, coaching all around the country, all these different spots. And for him to get a chance to come back to LSU and then Ed Ogeron is released and kind of keeping your fingers crossed, he was the one coach that was brought back. I know he is doing his best to make sure he stays there a long time and, and rebuilds that offensive line too. Yeah, I think that's that's what's really cool. When you when you talk to him, you hear the passion and, and just the excitement he has for coaching. And that that's what's so cool to me is that, you know, I, a lot of people have pride about, you know, different things they accomplish or accolades and all that. But, you know, this guy, what's really cool to me when you talk to him is that his passion for just teaching young people and being a mentor to them and a coach and everything else. Uh, it just sticks out when you get a chance to speak with him. And so I, I, I'm happy for him. And I hope that uh, these two young young freshmen playing as bookends get him a lot of attention and, and an ability to build a special group up front for that team. Uh, LSU's the underdog in this game. Tiger Stadium, I feel like, has impacted the matchups over the years, even the ones Alabama's won. It's maybe made the games closer. Can it impact the game? Uh, as Booger McFarland said, people aren't stupid. They're not going to be screaming and yelling if it's 21-0 in the in the first quarter and you're losing. But can you know can, can it impact the game? Uh, I definitely can. I mean, early in a game, that momentum, that that energy that you feel in a stadium, there's times when you walk in it and you can realize it's just a different day. And, and I think that, you know, no matter if you're in the NFL or college football, you can feel the teams that have great home field advantage and presence. Uh, it matters. And there's games where you go into it and realize, man, there's a couple things here or there that uh, if we just would have communicated better with that noise, we could have had a chance to be in this game. And I think LSU has a home place like that. And so obviously Alabama's played in a lot of big games. They've been in a lot of big situations. They'll be prepared. But having said that, it doesn't matter. It's still communication in the moment. Uh, you got to put up and, and show it on game day. And so I think it's going to be an opportunity for for Tiger Faithful and, and Death Valley to be roaring and give a chance to give our, give our team an advantage. All right. So Nick Saban the most complicated relationship in LSU history, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Were you at the 2007 game in Tuscaloosa? I interviewed a bunch of guys before the game, like in a uh, an RV lot. I'm not sure if you were there or not. No, but no, I wasn't. I, I – uh, so I, I actually – the only game I came to was um, Ohio State when they played down the Sugar Bowl. I was there at, at, in my first couple of years in the league. That was the, one of the games I was at. Yeah, you were already in the NFL at that point. That's right. But um, and quick, I don't know if this was an urban legend. If they were trying to soften the blow of Saban leaving or trying to sell us on less miles, but there was this urban legend that if Nick Saban came back, you were not going to be back in two thousand five. Is that true? That is not true. Okay. Uh, no, I I, uh, I loved Nick. I mean, I was a Nick guy. I was you know part of helping bring the recruiting class we had with him. And and so, uh, you know, I, a lot of people forget I was a Florida Gator. I was going to be a Gator until uh, Nick became the coach. And I got a chance to sit down and meet him and be around him. And that changed everything for me. And then it was about recruiting everybody else to join me. And so uh, yeah. that's still a really special class and, and a fun group. And so, yeah, I, I would have definitely been back with Nick. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I always enjoy those relationships because some of the things I learned from him are still things that I teach guys today. And, the opportunity I have to mentor coaches across the league and the NFL and, and different players. Uh, a lot of that stuff comes from the knowledge I learned from Nick. You know, at the time, Andrew, he was kind of a job hopper. And a lot of people said, well, he's not going to stay at Alabama that long. And fortunately for them and unfortunately for everyone else, it's 15 years now that he's been there. Are you, are you surprised by that? Or, or what are your, what are your thoughts? That he's won all those national championships with the, with the Crimson Tide. You know, I think really when you look at it, I think at LSU, if he, you know, I think it'd been fun to see what would happen if he'd have stayed because I think it'd have been a pretty rare run uh, of success in, in college football, much like what he's done at Alabama. Um, I just think in pro football, uh, you know, in the NFL, he got a little bit of a bad taste just going to, I think, what I would consider in the NFL, the only difference in really to me taking head coaching jobs, obviously they're much different than college football, but one of the biggest factors is the situation you walk into in the NFL, where the salary cap is, 
what their youth of their team is, what picks they have, all those type things are just huge factors. And uh, I think he could have definitely been successful. I just think that unfortunately it was a bad timing and it was not the right situation. And you've seen that with different coaches across the NFL. Um, and then when he got back to college football, I think he realized this is the domain I can dominate at and I don't have to worry about those things. And I think that's what made him plan his feet and realize this is, this is what I'm meant to do. Um, and I think he's been, you know, obviously unbelievable at it. And, uh, somebody that, uh, I haven't, I don't know if I've talked to him in 12, 15 years, but, uh, <laughs> I, I'd imagine, you know, it'd be just like, you know, we, we saw each other yesterday. If I saw him, I, you know, got a ton of respect for him and obviously he's been really good at what he does. I think Matt Mock told me the same thing that he hadn't talked to him maybe since, the national championship or shortly after or something. I know the guy's busy, so, but. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think there's two, it's, you know, that's who he is a little bit in his relationship. I mean, I think that um, he's one of those guys, cause I've talked to former players that do talk to him some, and, and it's a little more of uh, if you need me, like I'll answer the phone, you know? And so I think there's different guys that it's like, they need that confirmation or they need to hear from Nick or they want to hear things from him. You know, everybody's different. And so for me, I've never felt that way. When I see Nick Saban, uh, I'll have as much appreciation for him as I did after we won the National Championship. It's just, uh, you know, I've kind of made my own way and, and went off of my own and uh, I don't necessarily need his approval or confirmation, but uh, <laughs> I'll always appreciate our time. And, and he's always had a huge impact on me. He's always been on to the next thing so much, right? I mean, there's the stories after you guys won the national championship in 2015. He was already worried about hitting the road recruiting in the morning uh, and, and things like that. I mean, there was no, like, uh, I think your your great friend Kyle Williams told me that there was some assistant coach and his wife about to go to Bourbon Street and Saban said, I don't know where you think you're going, but we have a meeting here in 15 minutes, you know, right after the winning the national championship. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure he told us we could stick our rings where it, uh, the sun didn't shine. When we got him. So, uh, he, you know, he he uh, he was always locked in and ready for the next moment. That's for sure. <laughs> and I remember, too, he said uh, we got a bunch of guys on the sideline dancing and celebrating. They had nothing to do with the win. You know, making oh, him yeah. hungry for next year, you know, that kind of stuff. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right. I got a few things down memory lane with the great Andrew Whitworth. Bluegrass Miracle, Kentucky, 2002. What are your memories of that? I mean, a wild game and obviously a wild year. I mean, you, you know, it's coming a couple weeks after or maybe even the week after Matt Mott goes down with his injury and uh, in Florida after a huge victory for us. And um, I can remember Marcus Randall and and uh, coming in to take his job and, and take over with him injured. And, you know, that was a fun team. I, the, the one memory I have of that actual game is right before the play, Stephen Peterman, who was my veteran left guard at the time, looks at me and he says, hey, look, young guy, he says, hey, strap up your helmet a little tighter because they're about to, you know, ru rush the field and you're probably going to get hit right here. And so I was like, you know, he's like, you just got to get to the locker room as fast as you can. I was like, all right. So I strapped my helmet up and, you know, initially in the play, you don't even look, you block and then you get up and you just start running because that's what kind of all of us had said is, hey, let's just start running off the field to get out of here. Uh, you know, I got well, Gatorade and water and cool. You know, kids are throwing all kinds of stuff back there in the back of the end zone. And uh, next thing you know, you realize, oh, crap, you know, Devery just he's about to score and uh, it turned into a dog pile in the end zone. So I went from thinking I was going to tackle a couple fraternity guys on the way off the field to uh, dog piling in the end zone. <laughs> Will Muschiep said he didn't even see it. I think he was so ticked off with the way the defense played. He's walking off the field and it happens behind him. and He turns around like what? What happened? So. Oh, yeah, we were about to just take off for the tunnel. And then the next thing you know, we're dogpiling, celebrating, having fun. So I, I'll never forget some of those faces either. Just just people had already come over the stands. They were standing on the sidelines and just their faces after that. It, it was just like, what happened? It was <laughs> unbelievable. Nick saved his interview on the field, too. He just didn't know. He didn't know how to respond. He goes, I don't know what to say. I mean, I feel bad for Kentucky. I mean, you know, and so. The ending of that game really kind of went against everything he preached, right? Because you guys had played so poorly, but the result didn't match with the process, right? The process. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so I think that, uh, yeah, that's those are the kind that he does a great job of uh, having no emotion to. And so, uh, but it was a fun moment and it's something that will always be a memory of, uh, you know, of college, of the things I think about. It's just one of those games that will never, never go from memory because it's just such a uh, key moment and cool moment for that team. Marcus Randall uh, doing a great job as a high school coach now at Woodlawn High School here in, uh, in Baton Rouge. Ricky Collins is quarterback who's uh, committed to LSU. Uh, Andrew Whitworth, can you believe that next year will be the 20-year anniversary of the 2003 National Championship team? 
Man, that is crazy. Uh, you know, I, I, that's wild. I, I haven't gotten a chance to be at any of the anniversaries yet, so I'm looking forward to it. Be first year, I have a chance to come by, be be a part of that, and you know, see some of those guys. It's that was a special team, and wow, what a special moment! I, I when I think of that national championship, I think of me and Marcus Spears and Michael Clayton and Marquise Hill, and uh, a lot of guys all at the uh, first ever high school All American game in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we're trying to recruit guys to join us. I, you know, Tommy Harris, I'll never forget. We almost had him leaving Oklahoma to come join us. And I don't think Marcus and I have ever let him, da- let him live down the moment since that, uh, he decided to stay there just because of how that all turned out. But yeah, I think at that moment of us walking around there telling everybody we're going to win a national championship and in, uh, you know, a short three years, it happens. Uh, yeah. And some people are trying, I mean, you know, they're trying to say or hoping that what Brian Kelly's building with some of these classes can kind of match what you guys have with the Marcus Spears, the Michael Clayton's yourself, those guys that were part of those early recruiting classes. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you got to build it from somewhere. And what you really need this day and age too, is not just the one splash player, but you need guys who are committed to the fact that it's going to take a lot of us going there to win. And so it's, it's, it's almost, you need guys who are one good players, but two great recruiters themselves. And, and they can sell the dream of winning it together. And I think that's one of the biggest factors to, to turning a program around. Obviously, once you get it going, it usually supplements itself, but to turning it around, it's finding those guys that are also going to bring people with them. You played 1,008 snaps on the 2003 National Championship team. It says 920 on the offensive line. Where were the other snaps? Special teams? I, I guess. We must kick a lot of extra <laughs> points and field goals. <laughs> there you go. That's it. That's yeah. it. Exactly. Uh, okay, a couple of things from 2005. Um, I was I was interviewing uh, Roman Harper, and he was saying that when he played at Alabama, they weren't any good. He was kind of giving himself a hard time because in 2005, when you went to Alabama, they were 9-0 and and number four in the country. And apparently Kyle Williams gave the halftime speech uh, that game, and you guys won in overtime. Do you remember that? Uh, you know what? I'm sure he did. I don't remember that part as much. But, you know, yeah. Kyle uh, was always known to have a couple things to say. And, uh, you know, obviously him and I growing up right next to each other and then, you know, living together at LSU, uh, that's a special man. And uh, we'll always have a close bond. But he was always an amazing leader and a guy who set the tone for us uh, every week. So I, I would imagine, yes, I don't know what the exact words he said, but uh, Kyle was always fired up about something. That that red hair, uh, you know, he'd get <laughs> in fire and he'd, uh, he'd get after people, that's for sure. Here's my dream scenario that Andrew Whitworth and Kyle Williams go both go into Pro Football Hall of Fame in the same class. Is that possible? Man, it would be fun if it was. That that uh, that'd be really special. We'd go all the way from, you know, me mocking him at high school baseball games, you know, West Monroe Rustin, and him <laughs> coming to my basketball games, and you know, you know, him and his little buddies chanting me off the court. But every now and then, I'd lift my shirt up and show them my West Monroe State Championship T-shirts. <laughs> And then they'd all sit down and have to get quiet. So it, it'd be awesome because we'd have some good stories to share. That's for sure. Speaking of good stories, I did see some pictures of you in high school, and I can't believe that's you. That's you with the big bop? Oh, yeah. I've had you know, <laughs> hair back then. It, it didn't last long, but uh, I had some hair. You know, it was gone by the time I got to college almost. But, you know, I did have hair at one time, believe it or not. Yeah. Well, I, I kids I, don't believe me, but, you know, people that knew me then do. You certainly got lots of uh, support online. Vin Diesel uh, ruled what sexiest bald man. A lot of people thought, you know, that you got shafted on that. So yeah, it's a bad deal. You know, they're they're they're, they're asking for a <laughs> recount, and uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully, we're gonna get this thing sorted out. <laughs> In two thousand five, the uh, Chick Fil A Peach Bowl. Your famous quote about Miami as you guys won 40 to three that day. We kicked their ass on the field and in the tunnel after the game. There was a fight. Yeah, that was a pretty wild moment. I'll, I'll uh, never forget that one either. We won, we won the game. I was against my old buddy Eric Winston, the left tackle for the Dolph, I mean, for the Hurricanes, and uh, eventually a teammate of mine in Cincinnati after he played in, in Houston and Kansas City. But uh, yeah, it was, that was a fun game. A lot, a lot of relationships on both sides of the ball from that game over my time in the NFL. And we talked about it time to time. But yeah, it was the big uh, tunnel fight. Got a huge breakout fight going on in the middle of the tunnel after the game. You know, I, I don't remember exactly what started it, but something did. And uh, you know what? It was it was a fun moment, that's for sure. I I don't know that anybody got hurt or anything else, but it was uh it was more of just everybody, I think their season didn't quite go the way they thought. We came off of a year that we thought we could have been a lot better. I think everybody was just a little frustrated uh in Atlanta. 
It, it was certainly uh, symbolic. They they put it in the U documentary as as the the down like that sent them into a, a spiral after that. It did you know they were an amazing? I, I literally remember before we won our national championship is is the memory of sitting in my living room with my family watching, you know, them win theirs. And so I I to think of where they went from you know, that time in the early 2000s to after that game and, and from then on for the next 10 to 15 years is pretty wild. So it was a, a big moment for their team and, and uh, you know, for us as well. I think that uh, it was kind of the the uh, ending of moving on to a new regime. That was a big senior class of ours that year with me and Kyle and everybody else. So uh, there was a lot of guys that moved out and, and a new regime that moved in. All right. So in closing, Andrew Whitworth, Andrew Whitworth I'd like to apologize to you for – any emotional things I said about the Saints and Rams championship, NFC championship game of that season? Oh, and- there's been plenty of that. Look, I can't even go in my own town anymore in Louisiana. You know, it's like <laughs> hey, I'm waiting on people to congratulate me for the Super Bowl, and they're still mad at me about the one two years ago I didn't win. So, you know, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's great. But it's funny. You know, Sean Payton and I are actually pretty close, and so, uh, you know, it's it's it always comes up in some kind of conversation or something. I hear him talk about it. And uh, I'm always like, hey, at some point, him and I are going to be close. You know, we're going to be at a point where we can have the conversation and and, and move on. So it's uh, it's great, man. It's you know, it was a, a play, obviously, that uh, dictated a game. And obviously, it's something we wanted fixed in the game. It sent us on a big whirlwind in the NFL, though. I mean, you think about all the rules that changed and then went back to what they were before. That was a big moment in, in replay and everything else in NFL history. So. Uh, I'm glad I ended up on the positive end of it, uh, even if it means that I have to, you know, stop at the border check when I cross the Louisiana line now. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's still it's still a cool memory. <laughs> hey, man, I'm just staying on the sideline. I went out there. I have nothing to do with that. You hey, know? I was stuck in Gatorade and looking for some kind of, you know, sugar chew or something. I wasn't doing anything <laughs> useful in that moment. You did make a pretty good point, though, that. It's not a given that the field goal is good. I mean, we've seen crazier things happen, you know. So yeah, that's right. It's not a given, and and you know, in the end of the day, you you still you know, I, I go by my football view is it's no different than me and and uh, as an athlete, and when you're teaching your kids things, hey, sometimes things happen that are out of your control, but you know what you can control, you control, and the, the ball got snapped after that. Everybody had possessions after that, multiple of them, and. Yep. Uh, one team won. And and so at the end of the day, it's it's a really bad thing. Was it the right call? No, wasn't the right call, but one team handled the next 15 to 20 minutes better than the other. And 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 uh that's life. I mean, how you respond and how you handle things that aren't necessarily what you hoped would happen to you, uh matter. And so I think uh that to me, that's just the approach I, I had to it, even though that made a lot of people angry at the time. <laughs> I would have said the same thing if I was on the other end because I've been on the other end. I lost a game in Cincinnati Bengals Steelers, our first playoff win ever under the Marvin Lewis era. We had the ball with no time left and uh fumbled it away and then had two consecutive personal foul penalties called to help the Steelers kick a field goal to win a playoff game because they had no timeouts left and no ability to get all the way down the field. But uh the refs helped them do that. And so uh, I lost a playoff game because of it. Then I was there and I said the same thing after that game being on the losing end. So, yeah, uh, you know, it's tough. That's that's the life of uh, football, man. That's why it's such a great game. Well, and real quick, Bluegrass Miracle year, the end of the year, you guys have a game to go the, to the uh, SEC championship game against Arkansas. And Matt Jones, who I think was two of 14 before that final drive, somehow pulls it out on that miracle on Markham. That's what they called it. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's uh, Jason Peters, too, who went on to have a pretty decent career in the NFL, was playing in that game as well. Well, Andrew, appreciate all the time, man. Uh, you obviously are a, a legend here. And uh, Walter Payton, man of the year as well. All the great things you're doing to impact young people and uh, uh, just a uh, Amazing NFL career. Thanks for thanks for being on, man. Hey, I appreciate it so much. I'm looking forward to it. First time back in the boot to uh, uh, Baton Rouge to watch the LSU Tigers play in a long, long time. So I'm excited. Yeah, you are the team captain. I should have brought that up right away. You're one of the, the, the team captains this weekend. You'll be there. Yeah, I'll be there. First one. I think it's probably been 10, 12 years, probably since my kids were born, actually. Uh, I haven't been back since they were born. So uh, it's going to be fun to be there. And my wife's coming, too. So it's, we're, we're excited.